You can now get a 30-day trial to experience The Athletic for free. Visit the link in the description below to try it now. Association football is only in its second century of existence. China played versions of its own game, Kuju or Kickball, for two millennia. But the ball game of Mesoamerica, today's Mexico and Northern Central America, dates back even further and lasted for more than 3,000 years. And like our own times, the game was so much more than a game. And what a ball they played with. I don't understand how when the balls hit the ground, they are sent into the air with such incredible bounce, said Pedro Martia de Algeria, a Spanish courtier who saw the first ball brought back to Europe by the conquistador Christopher Columbus. Well, because all the stuff and bladder-filled balls didn't bounce. But in Mesoamerica, some 4,000 years ago, people worked out how to harvest latex from indigenous rubber trees, and amazingly, to mix it with the roots of the morning glory. And hey presto, this solidified the latex to produce an elastic bouncing ball, and who wouldn't want to play with that? The earliest archaeological evidence of the game are the small ball courts found in Chiapas, on Mexico's southern Pacific coast, and in the highlands of Oaxaca, built between 1650 and 1400 BCE. The game took its first settled, rule-bound and ceremonial forms under the Olmecs, who settled in Mexico's Gulf Coast around Veracruz between 1500 and 1200 BCE. Here, in the Olmec sprawling cities, hundreds of ball courts were created amongst religious and municipal buildings. Either rectangular or eye-shaped, they were lined with high sloping walls, some whitewashed, some painted with complex murals. Stepped stone seating of some kind surrounded most courts, and the largest made space for a big crowd. Now, rubber balls are perishable, and few have survived from any era. But carvings and drawings suggest that they could be as small as a handball and as large as a small basketball. Kicking and heading a ball of that size would have been dangerous, and the many clay figurines and stone-carved reliefs of players that have been found show the use of protective armour, helmets and gloves used for defence, but also to strike the ball with hands, hips, shoulders and thighs. The rules were never written down, but it seems that teams of two played a kind of volleyball across the central line, bouncing the ball off the side walls and into the air, hoping their opponents would fail to keep it in play. The Tepa de la Stella, a 1st century CE carved stone relief from Veracruz, shows a player being dressed by an attendant wearing a helmet, strappings on his lower arms, a pad on his knee and thicker armour around his thighs. These would have been made of a mixture of wood and hides and organic padding, and have long since rotted, but the game's symbolic weight was so great that we have a treasure trove of ceremonial versions of the items, but made from stone. The yugitos, which mimicked helmets and gloves, yukos, that wrapped around the hips, often carved with images of the sun and moon, frogs and toads, and psychoactive plants. Some yugas would be embellished by hachas, small stone carved heads that slotted into deep notches on the yucca. They were often rendered as skulls and other reminders of death. The Olmecs went into decline around 1200 BCE, but the game they'd given shape to outlasted them, spreading across Mesoamerica, taking a variety of new forms. On the Pacific coast of Mexico, there were hundreds of architecturally modest courts, each serving a single village. Around 100 CE, in the great city of Teotihuacan, the game was played in much grander spaces by nobles using sticks and clubs to shtick the ball. Spreading out from Veracruz, the game was played on the island of Hispanola and in what is now Puerto Rico. And it travelled as far north as contemporary Arizona, where it was played by the Hohokam peoples. But everywhere it was more than a game often accompanied by religious ceremonies, public festivities and theatrical performances, the game was a pastime and ritual. In some societies, it was accompanied by the human sacrifice of players, perhaps defeated enemies whose blood would placate the Mitzah god, and, like the seasons on which they depended, turn the cycle of life. In the El Tahin ball court reliefs of Veracruz, we see a defeated player, still in his body armour, about to have his chest opened and his heart extracted by an opponent. 
For the Mayans, who ruled Mexico's Yucatan and the highlands of today's Guatemala and Honduras from the 7th to the 10th centuries CE, the game was the very foundation of the world's creation. In the Popol Vuh, the Mayans' most important codex, we find the story of two Mayan ball-playing noble brothers, Hun Hunapu and Vuka Hunapu, who were enticed by the dark lords of Xibalba, the underworld, to descend to their realm and play the game. The Dark Lords won, killed the brothers, and buried their corpses beneath the demonic ball court. Except for Hun Hunapu's head, which was hung from a calabash tree. When the underworld goddess Skeek passed, the head spat on her, and she was impregnated, and then expelled from the underworld and sent back to Earth. There, she bore the hero twins, Hunapu and Shibalanke. Called back for the second leg on reaching adulthood, the brothers defeated the demons and escaped with their father's and uncle's corpses, which they placed in the sky to form the sun and the moon. Half a millennium later, the Aztecs, now the dominant society in the region, played the game for its patron deity, Xolotl, the morning star, but also for the purpose of gambling and pleasure. The Spanish conquistadors, when they arrived, were appalled and amazed by the ball and the game. Appalled one out and the game was repressed. Hundreds of ball courts were destroyed. Democratically annihilated by European disease and enslavement, indigenous Mexicans lost contact with the game that had made them for 3,000 years. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic brings you the best sports journalism in the world in a personalized experience, connecting you with the stories and teams that you care about the most. There's coverage of 13 sports, plus direct access to world-class journalists through live Q&As, discussions, and podcasts. Not to mention, it's all ad-free. And you can try it now for free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description.